You're listening to the Small Business Talk podcast with Kathy Smith. Welcome to Small Business Talk, episode 154. Today, my guest is Paul Higgins. Welcome, Paul. Great to be here. Thanks, Kathy. And Paul is from Paul Higgins Mentoring, and we are going to talk about how to scale your business fast and work less. And I think we all need to work a little less. <laughs> yes. So what would be your first tips for scaling our businesses fast? Yeah, look, I always say the first tip is the end in mind. You know, what what do you really want to do with your own business? I think so often we get into scaling fast first and we forget, you know, the old analogy, uh, if you've got the right ladder against the right wall. And, um, you know, I, I find, you know, when I've worked with lots and lots of People across across the globe, that's the first thing I say to them. So what do you really want? Do you want a lifestyle business? Do you want to exit in 10 years? Do you want someone to run the business? Like what is your ultimate ambition for the business? And therefore, we can set up a business to meet that ambition. And I think that's a really good thing, isn't it? Because we never get in our cars to go on a holiday and just drive. Which way do you drive? North, south, west. But we quite often run our businesses like that. We just get in the driver's seat and go, oh, there's a client. We'll do that one and another one and another one. And 10 years down the track, you look and go, how did I get here? So true. And even for myself, when I left corporate, you know, I had ambitions of building a, a, a huge business. And um, I had some health uh, health condition, which meant, well, it's the reason why I left business. One of the key reasons why I left business was to look after my health. And I had a mentor then, and he sort of said, look, you know, he'd scaled a a massive business and had a life-changing exit. And he'd been right in the bubble of, you know, San Fran and the, you know, entrepreneur scene there. And he just said, look, there's so many miserable people, you know, they, they don't, you don't see all the carnage behind it. You just see the, the end outcome of them having an exit. But he said, look, to me, everything you've told me, that's not you. So, so why try to, to create that? And it was, um, you know, it was a, it was a lesson learned early, which was, which was really, really beneficial. And, you know, sometimes I see that in others that they, you know, just, they, they, you know, it's hard to get that balance right between, you know, what you really want to do with your family and your life versus the business you're on or run. Absolutely. And I think people get that balance mucked up quite often and they don't really realise where they're going and they've got out of a a 40, 50 hour job to work on a 70, 80, 90 hour job for a boss that they don't like being themselves. And the whole reason that they got into business in the first place just gets annihilated. Yes, yes. So how would you say that we should prevent that? So we're going to have a, a clear plan of what we actually want to do then what what should we be looking at? Yeah, and and just quickly on the plan. So you've got, you know, like your personal plan, then it's the business model. And, you know, to me, there's sort of three key things. So the the first thing is what business model do you want? Do you want a membership-based business model? Do you want, a you know, a subscription-based? Do you want to be a consultant? What, What sort of business model do you want to have? And I think, you know, that's important to match to your lifestyle. And then from there, like, who are going to be ideal clients? Um, I, I learned early on that, uh, you know, I was just too broad. So, you know, I'm a big fan of actually niching or niching down and really picking uh, an audience that they know exactly that you're for them. But a lot of people will say, well, actually, Kathy, you're not, not for me. And the third thing is then go out and research that because we have a lot of built-in assumptions. So for me, I sold a tech consulting business, but the system I was in and the tech products that I sold are very different to maybe some other people that I'm helping. So, you know, my assumptions are there, but go and prove or disprove whether they're the same in your ideal client. So I think they're the three key components of the plan, which can help you speed up because it's, you know, it's like a a chain, I suppose, the more links you've got in the chain, sometimes the more damage you can do. So, you know, the, the uh, more open the plan is sometimes that can actually create uh, more headache for you. Yes, it certainly does because we get all these mixed messages. We're not sure who we're talking to or how we should be talking to them. And one of my favourite sayings is talking to everybody is talking to nobody. But people say, but you can. But even if you look at some of the really big examples like Facebook, they did not start talking to everybody and they still don't talk to everybody. They've got 
world domination, but they only have 66% of the people that they could have. So they still don't talk to everybody. They are quite specific. And as they've got bigger, of course, they've got broader, but they didn't start there. Yeah, now, now they've got multiple platforms, I suppose, as well, which has extended their reach. So it's not all through uh, Facebook itself, but they got Facebook right first. So, yeah, totally agree. Absolutely. And I think that's sometimes where we go wrong as we look at somebody a long way down the track and trying to emulate them from there, not where they actually started and the components and the foundations that they had to have to make sure that where they are now doesn't fall over. Yes, so true. So true. Okay, so we're looking at the plan. We've decided what kind of business model. We've got a rough idea of who we want to talk to and we're doing some research. Where do we go from there? Yeah, well, I think the number one thing as a business owner is you've you've got to sell, right? So now that you understand the ideal client, it's like what, you know, what can I sell? Because to me, I think the, the shortest definition of a business is you've got an offer that converts. And until you've got an offer that converts, it's not really a business. And, um, you know, I... I to me, the, the sort of second key one is around, well, what, what's that sales and marketing machine or engine that you're going to create to then get lots of people to, to um, buy that offer that is converting? And, you know, I certainly, you know, love to help people build up that, certainly from a, a sales side. So I know that, you know, you're great at marketing, Kathy, and you know, I normally lean on other people to maybe do the personal branding or the branding piece, but I love that intersection between, you know, the lead the lead, the lead generation into actually converting it into a sale and I've uh, done lots of work on LinkedIn as an example for B2B businesses in particular to really uh, leverage that. And I think sometimes people forget that they actually have to ask for a sale. They have to be out there showing people that they do actually have goods and services. Gone are the days where people just flocked past the shop and decided to buy. Even your digital shop, you've still got to send messages out there so people know that you're there. Yellow Pages is long gone, of course, but for a long time we had actually been sending those messages out and now we've sort of got into this sort of limbo where we think oh they'll find us they'll come to us we're on social media surely they'll see us and of course they forget that there's so many other people on social media as well and we have such short attention spans these days so you do actually have to have that sales component so that people know that they can buy from you yeah yeah and, and I think you know, if, if you reference, as you reference the yellow pages, I suppose LinkedIn has sort of become like that now, you know, there's whatever there is, seven, 800 million people on it. But, you know, the great thing is that you can use Sales Navigator to get very specific. So it's a paid service of LinkedIn, but you can get very specific to find your ideal client, which, you know, you've already defined in the plan. And, you know, there are people that you can um, can work out. And, you know, we sort of look at three key things. So one is, you know, have a great profile. Because, you know, most people now in business will go to your LinkedIn profile prior to anything else. And when you rank, when you look at your name on LinkedIn, oh, sorry, on Google, normally your LinkedIn profile is right up there, right? So I think that's really important. Then posting. And a lot of people, you know, get caught up in the vanity of posting. And look, you know, I must admit I'm super excited that I've got over 3 million views since I had my transplant in 2019. So, you know, that's been wonderful. But, you know, I... You know, it's not just about views for vanity's sake. It's people that are either in the cycle of buying from you that can go to those posts. They can actually, when they're checking you out, they can go to those posts. So it's a bit of a, a um, validity that, that you're the right thing. And the third piece is your existing customers, right? Yes, you talk to them, but sometimes you don't talk to them all the time, right? But they can get your content and get ideas from you even though it's not for you. So I think that's really important. And then um, I'll take a break there uh, to, to get any questions before I go into the third one, which is obviously the outreach is uh, prospecting. Yes, and I think that people don't often realise that the LinkedIn profile is so important and that people are actually looking at that. And if it's not filled in or it's not filled in correctly, and the biggest thing, of course, is people don't actually have their photo on there. Unfortunately, all that screams is scammer, scammer, scammer. So you must, 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 guys, put your photo on there. It's really, really important because people like to do business with people. So they need to know who you are and what you look like. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the other section, if we just quickly look at it, is the, you know, the header. 
So often, you know, the head, it's like the, someone's driving down the road and they see a, a billboard and, you know, you want them to easily understand your ad, right? So many people, it's not, it's, um, you know, even like people that are speakers, they, they put themselves up on stage. I'm like, yeah, what, but who are you speaking to? Like, you know, yes, you've got a nice crowd there, but who are you actually helping? So, you know, you know, for me, you know, I've looked at thousands of people's profiles as we've sort of reached out to people I normally qualify for my team to then further the process. And it's just so hard. Like if, if you can just make it easy for someone to spend two minutes on your profile, and like I said, you're going to alienate some people, well, that's part of it, right? And if a referral, you know, recommends you to somebody, they're not necessarily going to have, you know, i.e. you can serve people that just aren't on your profile. I came from Coca-Cola and at Coke, you know, there was so many people that drank the product, but we marketed to a very tight niche. And I think that's the exact same thing with, with LinkedIn. But like you said, if you don't make it easy for people, you know, uh, confused buyers rarely buy. Exactly. And yeah, if you can't understand what people are doing, then there's no way they're going to follow up and look any further. So some of these really fancy titles and things that don't mean anything to anybody can be a good talking point, but if you don't follow it up with what you actually do and some content behind it, nobody's going to go any further. Mm, So true. Excellent. Okay, so we're getting into stage three, which is outreach. Yeah, yeah. So, well, outreach is the... um the component of the middle systems, if you look at it. And, and, you know, to me, I'll keep this really simple. It's just, you know, only, only send stuff that you would be welcome, you'd welcome to receive. Right. And I think, you know, so, so many people get caught in the scripts and you're nervous, you don't know what to do. And you go do a course or you read something and they say, you know, send this script. Right. But it's not, it's not you, right? But you force it as you and um, you feel uncomfortable, the person receiving it's uncomfortable. You know, no one wins in that situation. So I think get very, you know, once again, you're very specific on your client. You've got a great profile. You're posting really good information. Then reach out and just reach out like you would in a face-to-face situation. You wouldn't go straight to, would you like to buy this? And I know everyone says it, so it's pretty obvious, but sadly not everyone does it. And we've got some wonderful techniques that we use uh, to to help make it easier in that way. But it's like, um, you know, LinkedIn have recently put in a limitation now. So it's a hundred outbound connections a week, right? So they, they're after quality. They, they don't want people to go on the platform and feel like they're constantly getting spam. And uh, I used to say in corporate, when someone would say, oh, God, I get so many emails. I'm like, yeah, but how many do you send, <laughs> right? Because maybe you could be part of the problem. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's the bit the same with spam. And um, I think that's a key thing with, our, with the outreach. Yes, absolutely. And just remember that they are people at the other end. So you just need to have that conversation, build that relationship before you actually vomit all over them. Because we've all had it. You, you get, hi, that's great to meet you, Paul. And then the next email is uh, the next message fills it up so much that you can't even read it. So have that bit of to and fro, like you say, like you would do in person before you actually literally verbally vomit all over them and say, buy my stuff. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, it's the classic of prescribing rather before you've diagnosed. And I've been lucky that, you know, one silver lining of having really bad health and having a kidney transplant is that I've spent a lot of time with doctors. And, you know, doctors are fantastic at asking questions and I've learned and improved my sales ability through that. And uh, I think, you know, that's the thing, you know, so often if, you know, just ask people if they actually, you know, got this challenge in their business and, you know, if they have, great, you can help them. If not, they might have it in the future and you can add them to your list. So um, that's the key thing around that. And then the last one is, uh, is obviously your team, you, you know, for you to be greater than just you, instead of having a job, uh, you've got a business. And I think that's where the, the team is the third element that really comes in. Yes, absolutely. So a couple of points there about, um, no, I've lost it. Obviously it wasn't important. It's just gone. So there you go. Um, and yeah, definitely having a team because otherwise you've just built yourself a, a very nice job that you can't get out of, which can be a real problem because if you want to take a holiday or if you need to take a break or like you say, if you haven't been well and for whatever the universe throws at you, 
then it is very difficult to continue to run a business if it's only built around you. And even when people do have team, they forget that they need to have that team without that key person dependency. So your desk can't be the, the roadblock. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. And, you know, for me, you know, you hear a lot of people saying that. I think there's, you know, one thing that I'd recommend every business owner has, and it can be someone with them. It can be someone remote now. And I think, you know, with the way that COVID um, has sort of forced us, for some people in remote, like I've been doing it for 11 years, but some people have been sort of forced to do it quicker. And they've realised that it's actually great to work remotely is, you know, having an assistant. And um, you know, I ran an outsourcing business that provided uh, assistance to people. And it was because I could see from my Coke days, we always had great resources. So we always had the teams and the technology to support people. But, you know, I just went in and started working with people and we do all the strategy. That's great. Okay. Next week. Oh, how and I didn't get a chance to do it. Week after, didn't get a chance to do it. I'm like, this is crazy. Let me get you a person that can, you know, get stuff done for you. And especially that sales component. Yes, um, you're the person that should, I believe, close deals, especially if you're, you know, a million dollars or less. I think it's really important to do that. And maybe it's even a little bit more. But the most important thing is 66% of sales is actually admin, or that's what Salesforce are telling me. I recently had Tiffany Bover on my podcast and, you know, there's 66% of that can, you know, or sorry, all of that 66% can be done by someone else. So people always say you're prolific, you're everywhere. Look, I've got a team of six people, right? And I'm one individual. But the reason that I'm everywhere is I've got people in Colombia, I've got people in the Philippines, I've got people in Australia, all working for me on different times, time zones that actually make me look a lot bigger than I am. And uh, I think, you know, that's really important. And if you don't have a VA, you know, I've got lots of people I can recommend you. I don't do it myself anymore, but I've got a lot of friends in the industry, but I think that's a really great place to start with your team. Yes, absolutely. And starting with those small steps, whether it is somebody local or somebody that um, you're outsourcing to, is really, really important. And building that trust and building your ability to actually communicate what you want them to do. Because even though you think it's easy, doesn't mean that you're communicating the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And look, we use a wonderful platform that's called Airtable. So just think of uh, the next version or uh, not the next version, but it's, I believe, just a, a um, better version for having Um, standard operating procedures and the way that you do your work, it's really good to have an air table. So for me, for example, a new client will come to me and say, okay, Paul, I I want a VA, but I don't know what they do. Right? I'm sure you've heard it, Kathy. I know lots of other people said the same thing to me, right? They know they need one, but they just don't know what to do. And we're like, okay, well, these, these, here's five different types and here's all the roles that they do. So we effectively get them to set up a free Airtable account. We just uh, transfer it straight from ours across to there. And then we go, bang, they're all the things that you should train and get your person to do. And in some cases, we actually go further and actually train their team as well. So I know a lot of you might be thinking, you know, it, I know everyone talks about it, but it's going to be hard work. But there are ways that you can make it easier. And that's when I talked at the start, the title was around, you know, how do you speed up your success? Well, um, I think that's a, a great example of that. So it's more practical than just saying, hey, you've got to go get a VA. And everyone's like, yeah, I've heard that before. But Paul, how, how, how can you help me? Yes. And I think that's very relevant too, because VAs can do an awful lot of things from basic admin to many more technical things, depending on what their skill levels are as well. So being clear on what you need, and like you say, if you don't need, you you don't know what you need, you need to ask for help to, to define that is going to make it a lot easier. I know when I got my first employee who um, actually came to my office and sat with me, I thought she would do everything I did, which of course, she's not a business owner and never wanted to be a business, business owner So it it took us about 12 months to realise we'd both made a terrible mistake. We're still friends to today, but we learnt a lot along the way. And my next hire, I had a job description, so she knew exactly what she needed. Yeah, yeah. And and I think it's, 
you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, go to those people that have gone before you. So I've always had a mentor. I, I continue to have mentors. At the moment, I'm doing some tweaking around my personal brand. I can't see the label from within inside the jar. I'll go and get help. I know that you help a lot of people, you, their marketing and social media, you know, so don't think you've got to do it all yourself. And, you know, sometimes it is taking a bit of a, 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 a punt with people by, you know, investing ahead of the revenue curve but I often say to people like you know the changes that you make yes in the short term might be difficult from a cash flow perspective but you got to think you know if this is a 10-year return on this item and you're going to run your business for 10 15 years right it's actually a small investment over the 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 time on that and one thing I'll I'll definitely talk about is you know getting um multiple opinions on who you should work with as well. I know that a lot of us, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm quite intuitive. I love to make quick decisions, but I know sometimes I make quick decisions that you know, I haven't done my research and I haven't done my homework and it's made it hard. And that's why I've collected about, I uh, forget the number now, it's over 600 experts around the world. Well, someone says, hey, I need someone. I'm like, okay, for marketing, there's Kathy. There's also two others you can choose. But I think that's really important as you start to release everything uh, being about you. Yes, absolutely. And making sure that you're actually comfortable working with that person and that you do have rapport and you can communicate because it doesn't matter how good their skill level is. If every time the phone rings or a message comes you through, you think, oh, my God, it's that person again, that's not going to be a good working relationship for you. So just make sure that you do have that. The other thing is make sure that you're getting apples for apples and that you're not comparing just simply on price and then finding out that you've taken the lowest price and down the track, you've only actually got half of what you were looking for. So just making sure that you have that clear scope of what it is that you're looking for and making sure that you're actually getting that, not just half of it, and then picking the cheaper price and end up costing you a lot more down the track. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, you know, sometimes if you can learn from others that have gone down that path that, you know, I call it the, the highway to success. So we all want to get to wherever that destination destination is, which you start, you know, the start, you know, what's the end in mind. But there's so many little uh, sidetracks you can take, you know, Sometimes you can even double back, which, you know, over my 10-year journey running my own business, I've had several of those. But if someone can say to you, hey, you know what, uh, I went down that path before and this is the outcome that I had. Now, your situation might be different, but at least they're then aware of what some of the, you know, the uh, potholes in the road could be. Absolutely. And sometimes for the bow to go forward, you have to actually pull it backwards so it can reach velocity. So just because you see something that you need to go back or go around doesn't always mean that that's going to hold you back. It just might be just a little bit of a stumbling block or it might actually be the opportunity that you needed. Yeah, 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 wise words. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking about how to scale your business fast so that you work less. So have you got some tips on working less? Yeah, well, look, I think, you know, everything I've suggested so far is is working less. But one one key thing I always do is, you know, it's uh, I'm a big uh, fan of Stephen Covey and he always talked about that. You know, and I go back and laugh now at the, you know, crazy 80s video with the perms and, and everybody in it. But the message is still really relevant today that, you know, put the big rocks in first. So put in what you want to do in your personal life into your diary first right? So that's a, a positive constraint. And then you work your time around that. So, um, you know, don't say, you know, I'm just going to work and then I'll do whatever I need to do at the end. It's like, no, here, these are all things. So I might have, you know, let, let's say you got 70 active hours or 60 available hours in a, in a week, in a five day or sorry, in a five day period. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to fill these with all the personal stuff. So then I've effectively might have only 30 left now to do work. So that's a positive constraint, which means that then the technology, the team, the systems, all those things I talked about before helps you deliver it within those 30 hours rather than, you know, time expands to, I forget the saying, but I'm sure you've heard it, you know, time expands to, to what you make it. So, or what you don't make it, I should say. Yes, absolutely. If you give yourself two hours to do a task, it will generally take two hours. Yes. If you've only got an hour, then 
we can make amazing things happen. Always think about the last day before you go on vacation or holidays. We can do amazing things in that last day because we don't want it sitting there when we come back. So yes. sometimes some imposed restraints can help as well. And people that say they don't have time for holidays, you need to look in their diary and see, have they actually marked them in? And have they let the team know that they're going on holidays and scheduled work appropriately? Yes, yes, so, so true, so true. And, you know, like it's, we all think that, you know, we're, our business is so, you know, it, it's so reliant upon us. We don't want to let people down. But, you know, there's a lot of people that have gone through that pain and got out the other side. And, you know, it's a wonderful world like I am uh, when I'm at that other side. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's always scary to begin with, like change is. You know, we're not that used to change. But once you make it, it become enjoyable. And if I can uh, if I can work and run a very successful business that I exited whilst on a dialysis machine, I think most of us can find time to, uh, you know, to, uh, to do it right. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just that motivation that you need. And we hope that you don't all end up sick to get that motivation. No. So, so make sure that you're allowing yourself that time so that you can keep your health so that you don't end up with a problem. Yes. Fantastic. So have you got any last tips for our audience, Paul? Yeah, look, um, I've got uh, a resource that they can go to that really covers these key topics, the topics that you've We've talked about today and uh, there's nine questions and in three minutes you can effectively answer the questions and it's really about how can you double your revenue with spending less time so that's the the key thing and you know i just like i said i've been successful and and done it so some of my learnings in there and also the learnings from other mentors and then at the end of that depends on what you answer um we can have a call and then talk about, well, what are those gaps? It's not a sales call, but it's just to say, well, look, okay. Um, it's my way of giving back to say, look, well, you know, given the situation I've gone, given the answers you've got, well, this might be the best plan of attack for you. And that's at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash pulse. Fantastic. And we'll put that in the show notes. Okay, at this time in the podcast, it's up to the final five. Are you game for five questions? Yeah, sure. Far away. What is the best advice given to you by a mentor? Yeah, so it was have an offer that converts. Fantastic. What is the best help you have received since starting your business? Yeah, I think it was those initial people. So when I left corporate, the initial people that gave me work, because normally it comes from your close network. And then from there, it's been the mentors that I've worked with. Excellent. What is the one thing that you have to do every day? You're non-negotiable. Yeah, so I've got a list of habits. I, I tick them off on an app called Done, and I won't go through all of them, but one of them that is key there is sales time. So I have to look at my leads and my deals every day. Fabulous. What is your favourite business book and why? Yeah, so I'll look down here because I had to write it down because I always say it the wrong way around, but it's Ready, Fire, Aim by Michael Masterson. It's a fantastic book. And it really talks about the practicalities of you doing most of the sales up until the, the first million dollars. Wow, that's a, I love that section of the podcast because everybody answers different things. So we haven't had that one before. So that okay. is really good. Okay. What do you wish you had known when you started out? Yeah, to be brave to niche or niche down. So you know, I would, anyone that walked past with a heartbeat was a potential client when I first started. I think the more niched or niched I got, the more success I had. So I wish I had have done that earlier. Yes, I think that's a scary thing for a lot of people. But once they do it, they realize what a game changer it is. Fantastic. So thank you very much for your time, Paul. And would you like to leave our audience with one final thing? Yeah, so the most important thing is go and get someone to help you, right? Don't do it all by yourself. Go and get someone to help you. Like I said, I've got mentors. I mentor lots of people, but go and get someone to help you because you don't have to do it all by yourself. Fantastic. And if people would like to know more about you, where can they find you, Paul? Yeah, so just go to Paul Higgins. Uh, pretty easy to spell, paulhigginsmentoring.com. Excellent. And we will put that in the show notes. So SBT audience, enjoy your journey. Don't forget to subscribe to Small Business Talk podcast and head on over to Small Business Talk 
www.ruthcarroll.com.au forward slash downloads for all the show notes and links to this episode. Remember, to be great, you must start. Pick one tip from today's episode, take action and implement it. Let's meet again next week at the same time and place. Until then, take action. And SBT community, enjoy your journey.